My guest today is film director Rachel Annette Helson and her Oscar-qualified short film, Good Daughter. Now, Rachel's feature film directing credits include The Engagement Dress, How to Live Your Best Death, and The Girl in the Window. But her most recent feature is The Air He Breathes, which debuted earlier this year. Now, as a character-driven director, Rachel is heavily influenced by her acting background. Select credits include Full Circle, directed by Steven Soderbergh, The Nick, Law & Order SVU, and the Netflix film The Polka King. But she also holds the distinction of being the youngest producer in Broadway history to be nominated for a Tony Award for her work on Neil LeBute's Reasons to be Pretty. But her 2023 short film Good Daughter, starring Samantha Sloyan, from Midnight Mass and Grey's Anatomy, and written by Jesse Harris of Marvel's Jessica Jones, played as an official selection of Holly Shorts, Center Film Festival, and the Catalina Film Festival, where Samantha was nominated for Best Actress. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Rachel Annette Helson and her Oscar-qualified short, Good Daughter, to the show. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, Appreciate it. You're very welcome, and... What a film this was. There was just so much to absorb with this storyline. And uh, Je Jesse Harris, who did, who, who is the writer of Good Daughter, um, and was also, again, the script writer for the Netflix series Marvel's Jessica Jones. How did both of you connect, which led you to directing this film? Well... So both Jesse and I uh, are from Kentucky and we had never met before, um, but we, uh, I was looking to make a short film and I asked all of my producer friends, everyone I knew in the business really, like I, I need to find this a good story. I, I need to connect with a writer. And uh, my friend, Emily Carroll, who's a producer also from Kentucky, I feel like you're gonna hear a lot about Kentucky in this interview. Um, so much so, in fact, when we were doing a talk back at Holly Shorts, they made fun of me for how much I mentioned it. Um, um, she connected me with Jesse and she was like, you two have to meet. You have very similar tastes. And so we met over Zoom um, because I live in New York and Jesse lives in L.A. And we had a great conversation about, um, you know, I love very character driven pieces. I love kind of morally gray characters, people that live in those shades of gray of life. And if you've seen Jessica Jones, that's very much uh, what that show focuses on. And, and Jesse, just his voice is phenomenal and he's able to capture that so well. Uh, so we talked to each other, we were like, I think, I think we would be good to work together. And, um, and about a week later, he sent me the log line for Good Daughter, which is this, the same log line that it is today, which is a small time con artist rips off elderly dementia patients by pretending to be their daughter until the con catches up with her. And it was like I had full body like jolt of energy. I was like, I have to make this movie. I have to make this movie. This is exactly what I've been looking for. Um, and he wrote just a banger of a script. And the, the script that um, made it in, it was the shooting script was pretty much the first draft. We developed the the story um, via like, you know, an outline. And then he wrote this first draft that was amazing. And I was like, well, <laughs> there are a few tweaks here and there, but this is pretty darn incredible, um, which just never happens. And and I, um, I'm just so thrilled that we got connected because he's awesome. Well, how did you come to cast Samantha Sloyan from Grey's Anatomy? Oh, well, I had seen Samantha in um, an, the, the miniseries Midnight Mass on Netflix, which is Mike Flanagan's miniseries. And in that show, she plays a character named Bev Keen, who is very different from Rebecca, who she plays in Good Daughter. Um, but what they have in common is Bev Keen um, had this full body belief that what she was doing was the right thing to do. Her terrible ideas were the right thing to do. 
And I was like, wow, that is a really tough thing to pull off as an actor. Um, I haven't seen many actresses do that. And, and so when I was reading the script for the daughter and thinking about who would make the perfect Rebecca and who would be able to bring humanity and humor to that character, have you, have you like her despite yourself um, and feel for her even when she's doing the worst possible thing? Um, I, I was just like, I don't know Samantha, but I, I have to take a shot and, and reach out to her. And so my, I uh, have a very good friend who's a casting director at Telsey and Company. And I was like, will you please be a casting consultant on this? Will you help me? And he reached out to her representation and, and I don't know why she said yes, but I'm so glad she did. She said yes to a stranger <laughs> and to come play this part. And I was thrilled, so thrilled to have her because I think she just makes the movie. You know, um, I, I've been hearing this this year where there are short films that have very recognizable actors. Mm -hmm. And to hear the stories of the filmmakers, regardless if they're young, up and coming, or even, you know, they got a, a great resume behind them in film. To reach out to someone that people know and recognize, and then they say yes, I'm yeah. like, you know, more power to you for stepping out and at least trying, because a lot of these stars today, they're looking for the opportunity to do a high quality short. So go for it. Oh, I'm a swing for the fences kind of gal. Like I say, she was my first shot and there was no way I wasn't, or my, my, the, my first choice and there was no way I wasn't going after that. So yeah, uh, I love that. Choice. Yeah. And then, you know, when I was watching this film, I was, I was watching the character Rebecca because, you know, in short films, it's really hard to, do character development. Yeah. And, but Rebecca needed a little bit of character development because, because of the storyline. So I'm, I was watching the film. I'm like, okay, what shaped Rebecca? So then I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, she seems to be living in a temporary one room apartment or an extended stay motel, which may mm -hmm. suggest she's constantly mobile or most likely due to her being a con man. Mm -hmm. And then everything she seems to own is in the trunk of her car. Mm -hmm. She knows how the assisted living centers work and she knows which patients never get visitors. Mm -hmm. And those are the four things I pulled out of her. Yep. You're, you're spot on. You are spot on. And I mean, I think that, <clears throat> To me, Rebecca, when I read that, because I'll go ahead and give away the ending here. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm actually I've got I've got something coming up for that. So if you okay, want to wait, well, and not give it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I, I I'm doing it in a poignant way. <laughs> I will not give away the ending then. Yes, I I mean I think it's it's so much fun to spend time with characters and get to see their day-to-day -day life, especially when there's someone, you're taking a look at someone who's um, a little out of the ordinary. Um, you're right, everything she kind of owns is in her car, in bags that are labeled by other people's names. Um, <laughs> and everything that's in her single room occupancy, it's its thrift, it's vintage, it's, I mean, it's hung by, by um on the ceiling almost because she doesn't have this much uh like she doesn't have proper furniture or she has a mattress on the floor very transient um, um but i love seeing a character's day-to-day -day life shooting that montage was one of the most difficult things in this film to do just time wise but i always felt like it was so necessary so we could really get a sense that like she's a workaday woman um, and I like the little, the little specific moments too, where she has a day where she eats oatmeal that's too hot. <laughs> like that's just my favorite, favorite thing to shoot on film. Um, and because uh, as we've said, I'm a, I'm a character driven kind of director. I come from an acting background. So finding those little moments that where someone can recognize a piece of themselves, um, where it's like, oh, I do that. Oh, I have a moment. Like, even if it's, even if you come from a completely different background, something that you share, 
Um, and I always feel like the more specific a moment is, the more universal it becomes. Um, so I aim for, for moments like that and, and little details. You know, there was, there was something I noticed. There's two scenes where her phone goes off in the morning. And it's like mm -hmm. her alarm and her alarms. And the funny thing is the alarm goes off at two different times, but yeah. it's still like the nine o'clock hour. And I'm like, she is not a motivated person. Mm -mm. It's nine o'clock. Everybody would have been up by seven. And, and if you're going to be a con and you're going to be a good one, you, you would have been focusing on all of the little details. So she was, she shows this, I call it a slight lazy streak. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I was getting exhausted as Rebecca was trying to keep track of all the people she was conning. I mean, yeah. what was it like directing Samantha, which she had to change characters now, mostly by name, but also mm -hmm. by look. And then she had to change her demeanor just a tad yeah. Um, just to kind of figure out that maybe that's how that person's daughter really was. Oh, sure. And I think that, I think that character, Rebecca, the character, I think she had the most fun pretending to be other people. Um, to me, sh she comes in, uh, my favorite kind of persona that she puts on is Tina. So it's the one with the glasses because she's talking to this this receptionist and this receptionist the actress that plays her has a has a very southern lilt and uh and, and tina the character suddenly becomes a little more southern has a has a little twang to her so i think she kind of absorbs the behavior or, and mimics the behavior of whoever she is with um and to to either get in their good graces or to um kind of just pretend to be someone outside of herself. Because as we've said, she lives in conditions that are not very, you know, pleasant to live in. So when she's pretending to be someone else, I think it's a far better experience for her. Well, um, well you bring something up and a lot of people in business still don't know this tactic. And it is called mimicking the person mm -hmm. you're talking to. Yeah. And when you mimic another person, and if you're in sales, and you mimic the other person just ever so slightly. If they move their mm -hmm. arm, you move you, your arm. And it what it does is it causes the other person to like you yeah. because they believe you're actually agreeing. And so mm -hmm. she's using that very tactic with everybody she meets. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And I think that Samantha had a lot of fun with that, too. Um, I mean, she's fantastic just in general and can pick up on things so quickly. And really, she she brought such um, specific ideas to each kind of character that she was playing. Because she wasn't just playing Rebecca. She was playing Rebecca and Sarah and Aaron and Tina <laughs> um, and all of these different characters. So she was playing a lot of different people. Um, and when she slipped kind of in and out of those things, um, and we, we kind of spoke about specific moments, but she is a pro. She like came in and, and nailed that. And I think that a lot of, um, we had, I had great discussions too with our, our costume designer, Molly Morgan, about what each of these characters looked and felt like and, um, who they were based on the the parents that she was visiting and the different nursing homes that she was visiting. Um, so you can tell a lot about, even if you don't see the Alzheimer's patient that she's visiting by her look and dress and demeanor, um, because she is supposed to be the daughter of that person. So it was almost like Samantha was giving an acting class by changing these characters yeah. ever so slightly. But there is something really funny in this film and not everybody's going to get it, which, <laughs> which made this film even, which made this, 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 this part, this element of this film funny because there are people who are going to go, Oh yeah, I remember that. And then there's other people going to watch the film and going, who's that? So <laughs> the funny element of the film was that the young man in the pawn shop didn't know who Lee Majors was. 
I grew up watching the Six Million Dollar Man, so I know. So I thought exactly. it was so. I thought it was so funny because, and I feel bad. I feel bad for the generations today. Yeah. Because television back in the late sixties and the seventies was awesome. <laughs> I mean. You know, because, you know, we had the six million dollar man. Yeah, we had the bionic woman, but we had we had chips. We had emergency. We had Adam 12. You know, we had green acres. The list goes on. And now you're like, why does everything on TV suck? <laughs> so why? So why did you choose the celebrity to be Lee Majors when it came to that watch? You know, that is, I got to say, that's pure Jesse Harris, but also Lee Majors is from Kentucky. Um, so there's, you know, there we set the, the movie in Kentucky. She has all these Kentucky licenses. Like I said, you're going to hear a lot about Kentucky. Um, but we thought it was quite plausible that that, El that Alzheimer's patient could have been friends with Lee Majors. They were would be about the same age and, and might have received that watch from Lee Majors. So we felt like it was a good kind of cultural touchstone. But also the fact that, you know, Rebecca is spending so much time with these, these patients who are older. And while, yes, she steals from them, she also does spend time with them. So their references become her references and uh, so much so many of the clothes that she wears are vintage probably because she's stolen them but also like that those are the kind of conversations that she's had so she's made an effort to know the references and the cultural touchstones from those times um so that was very specifically planted in there but i gotta say lee majors was all jesse jesse that he came up with that completely <laughs> you know that that is that is so funny because i'm on the north side of houston and lee used to live here oh really uh, and when he and of course farrah fawcett is known to be from texas Houston. So I thought, this is really kind of cool. But the other thing was too, in Rebecca's mind, she thought she had a big score on her hands. But if nobody knows a celebrity that is connected to the item, so so the item itself looks like, hey, wow, this is nice. Yeah, but it was owned by so-and-so. Yeah. If the other person has <laughs> no clue who that is, there is still no extra value and there's right. still no extra value if there's no documentation, paperwork exactly. to actually prove it. So she's holding on to something that is like this little seesaw and mm -hmm. she doesn't know what to do because she's kind of aggravated that the guy at the pawn shop. Yeah, doesn't know. Absolutely has no clue. But you bring something up that is so subtle in this film when she spends time with every patient mm -hmm. she's sitting there looking at her watch basically and but she's picking up the clues that when they are lucid mm -hmm. in some state she's mentally tracking the little elements of that person's life so when she comes back yeah she can bring it up so the other yeah. person thinks oh yeah you're my daughter yeah. And, and I like, because it like, she was sitting by when she was sitting by the man that basically in a way figured it out, you know, yes. um, I'm like, how exhaust, I mean, I've sat by someone's bedside. It is the most boring, exhausting mm -hmm. thing a human can do. And I'm thinking, how many times a day is she doing this? <laughs> oh, all day. All day, I think. I think she has done it all day. And part of the thing about Rebecca that I always thought was interesting, the dichotomy of her, is that you meet her when the, a patient's asleep. And like there are several patients that are asleep and she is sitting next to their bed. So she could be robbing them, but she's not. She is, is spending time with them. She's actually holding their hand. Um, you, you meet her when she's holding someone's hand. Um, and I always thought it was an interesting kind of juxtaposition of someone that is, is giving time to people 
and taking things that they won't even remember that they ever had. Um, uh, so that I always found fascinating. Specifically, I've had two, both of my grandmothers passed away from Alzheimer's and you see it's, you see a lot of patients that are very lonely, that are, their families don't come to visit them anymore because it's too sad. Um, and, and people just have lives that move on. So they are left there alone. And the idea that Rebecca spends her days with these people. And the only reason she gets away with this is because their families have stopped visiting. So I think that in her mind, in some very twisted way, she is doing a public service. Yeah. <laughs> And that's the thing. In my mind. <laughs> but in her mind, she is doing a public service. Yeah, but she picked it up from the assistant care living nurse that says, Oh, mm -hmm. you know, after a while, you know, you know, you're such a good daughter because yeah. everybody else, they just stop coming. And I'm like, yeah. and that's why you do it, because you know your chances of getting caught are extremely slim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, elder crime is massive. My my uncle is actually um, an investigator of elder abuse at a district in the district attorney's office in San Diego. And the amount of elder crime that that is around us that happens constantly, it's amazing. It's rampant, and it's not talked about that often because you know it, it's it's not a sexy topic for one. But also, a, a lot of the people. They're, it's kind of the most vulnerable population that can't speak up for themselves necessarily. So it's not um, as well known as, as maybe uh, it should be. Um, but yes, absolutely. It's there that she has a very small likelihood of getting caught specifically for that reason. Okay. I have a question because I really couldn't figure it out. And maybe <laughs> it was ahead. just, maybe it was just for the scene. The last patient, yeah. she goes over to this, this type of desk and she pulls the drawer out and she sees the checkbook mm -hmm. and she opens up the checkbook and she's like, score. Mm -hmm. So she rips a check out and the first thing she writes on the line is cash, but she doesn't mm -hmm. fill it out. Mm -hmm. I got to thinking, if the guy is a dementia patient, what's his checkbook doing in the drawer? Mm, yes. Well, that is a good question. It's it's because his family member has left it there. I think she's probably cleaned everything else out and goes for cash last. Um, my thought too with with her and and conning all the patients is that she's been there. She's she's been to Earl's bedside several times. His room used to be a lot fuller than it was, and I think she probably goes for the checkbook very last because that's. I don't know whether his kids have a, an eye on that bank account, but my guess is that if, if cash starts disappearing from from the bank account, that would be a bigger red flag than stealing something else. Yeah, but you know what? There's something else to think about. If, if the families stop visiting the dementia mm -hmm. patients because they're in the, the late stages, so they literally just rarely yeah. remember anybody. Yeah. That means... Because those patients no longer have their own home. They're, they're, right. They live there. Right. That means somebody has to pay the monthly bill. Mm -hmm. And that's why the checkbook is in the drawer. Mm. You know, I so that means, yeah, a family member may only show up once a month. Yeah, exactly. To pay the bill and leave. Which actually leads to something really kind of funny. Because the only person that she couldn't con was the security guard at the other assisted living center. <laughs> this is true. She yeah. didn't con him. <laughs> yeah. She did not con him, but I would say she, she bribed him pretty good. <laughs> yeah, she did. You know, the, the death of the one patient, I guess it was Earl. Um, yeah, Earl. She never factored in the death of a patient mm -hmm. inside her con. Oh. Mm -mm. No, it was a total surprise. I think she she just never expected that. And I think it was a moment where it kind of shook her and she was like, what am I doing? She had to kind of come to Jesus moment in that. <laughs> uh, as soon as she, she he died and she was just like, 
what am I doing? I have to get out of here. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> and then uh, kind of decides to, to change her ways, I well, think, after. How did, you after do the ca- how did you do the camera shot? Because when she walks out of that room, mm-hmm. the whole her whole world is spinning. So yeah. how did you do that particular camera shot? Um, we, I I have a wonderful director of photography named Danielle Elise Bartley. So that was actually shot at, you're gonna laugh. So obviously when you're making a short film, you are going and you are begging for any single location that you can have. And luckily I am friends with a wonderful, wonderful, uh, doctor in Kentucky, who's a plastic surgeon and his sister who run their own plastic surgery center. And that was actually a plastic surgery center that they let me use. (laughs) So it was, it's real medical equipment that's around there. It's a real medical office building. And um, they pre-lit that, that building, um, uh, my team. And she came out the door and Danielle was able to kind of, to follow her. And that's all handheld. That was all shoulder on Danielle's shoulder. She's very good at handheld. And she did a, a total circle around Samantha. So as Samantha was like, you know, turning one way, Danielle was turning the other way. So they, they were dancing in a way. Um, and yeah, I love that shot, actually. That's what you know, I don't know what was a bigger shock to Rebecca. Was it Earl passing away? Mm-hmm. Or was it her dropping her purse and all of her IDs <laughs> across the floor? And I'm like, which one would have scared her the most? Oh, you know, I think it, it was a kind of a double whammy, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, it was. If she, I would say Earl, because I would argue that if she had just fallen and almost gotten caught, she might've gone back to that con, but having someone die on your watch, that made her, that made her rethink her life decisions. So I would say Earl, but yes, she definitely has a, has a double whammy there, uh, like falling and everything flying out of her purse. And I think at that point, she's probably so shaken that she doesn't see what's right in front of her, which is why she ran into that security guard because she was just booking it out of, out of that uh, facility trying not to get caught. Um, so of course she's going to run into someone and everything's going to fall everywhere. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it was so scary because I'm, because I kept thinking of the aftermath, like, I mean, is the center going to, call her to come and get the body, you know, cause I kept, I kept thinking, man, if there was a funeral scene in this film, that would have been awesome. <laughs> you, know? Oh, you know, the real daughter would have come to that funeral. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now there's a, there's a come to Jesus moment right then and there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, right in front of everybody. Because I mean, you could. I mean, for a feature film, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. there is so much to play with here. There is, yeah, there is. It's it's a subject matter ripe with uh, with material, um, and we we do have a feature film that that we're working on that is based on this. You, you know, it did not start as a feature film. It did not start as a, or as a proof of concept for a feature film. It really just started as wanting to tell a short film. But after we finished it, we were like, there's, there's more here, right? Like, I just, you could see the rest of the movie. And you're right. There's so many possibilities of where she goes and what she does. Um, so yes, there is a, there's a lot of material for a feature and uh, perhaps one along one on the way. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the big twist in this film, that's when, I mean, she was conning patients to help her own mother's care. Yeah. Who also had Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that was, uh, that was, that was the big twist. Yeah. I, she, um, I think that that's why she's a good daughter. Um, she was doing all of this for her mother. Um, and in my mind, how she even discovered that the con was a con was that she spent time in these, these care facilities and she, because she was with her mother and she saw the patients that were there and she knew that they wouldn't be having visitors and, um, that they're, was an opportunity for her to kind of make some money and, and um, 
be able to pay for her mom's care, but she is a desperate, driven woman. Um, so I call her a con artist because she is, but I also think that Samantha and I had this discussion beforehand about like, was she con prior to starting this con? Um, and I always thought that she was not. Um, my opinion was that she, she was um, desperate because she needed to pay her mom's bill and Alzheimer's care is incredibly expensive. I mean, it's just outrageously expensive. And I think that it probably drained her finances, drained her mom's finances, and she was pretty much left with nothing and no ability to, to kind of take care of her. Um, so that is why she's been trying to make ends meet doing this. Um, but yeah, that's she just chose a very, very poor path and way to do things. Well, yeah, and, and you know, and that's the thing. Assisted living care for dementia patients can range from six to 10 grand a month. Oh yeah. It's and massive. so, yeah, it's massive. People have no clue. They're like, you know, you, you may need to start thinking about saving up for retirement because if that happens, yeah. you're going to lose it all based on the cost of these, of these centers. Absolutely. But this is the interesting part. Her mother's room was very stark, which means she's not in the upper level no. of an assisted living center that caters strictly to Alzheimer's patients. Cause there's a big difference between the centers, yes. So it's yeah. very stark, very empty, but she had no problem sitting with a strain by with a stranger's by a stranger's bedside, but she had a hard time when it was her own mother. So here's some of the things that I noticed going into that scene. Mm -hmm. I thought the little precious moments figurine was mm -hmm. a nice touch. Cause I said, ah, a clue. <laughs> it was ironic that her mother had a crucifix hanging on the wall yeah. because Rebecca couldn't save herself from that moment, but she yeah. even turned and glanced at it while taking the hand of her mother. And I thought you couldn't shot that any better. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, she, she was not it to me. It also speaks to her background and where she came from too. She was, she was raised better than this. Um, and I think that uh, it's just a small brief, like small clue into to who she was before she did all of these things. But um, and I think she clearly judges herself, uh, for, for the things that she's doing. You know what she did? She judged herself. But what was, what I love about this, this twist in the story, mm -hmm. you cause the audience to go, this girl is just evil. And then in the end, you're like, oh, that's why she yeah. was doing it. And so mm -hmm. you completely just screw with our head on this deal, but that's what's, <laughs> But that's what film, <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do in situations like this. And it worked. So now at the oh, end, the audience is not even mad at her. I know. I know. I just, it's, I wanted to really kind of, to, to me, I, I just, I like seeing my characters do what they do. And I kind of just wanted to turn the tables on them. See if I could subvert your expectations of who this person was and why they were doing what they were doing. Um, because I, I was always taught in acting school not to judge the characters that you're playing. So I like to kind of dig deep into character background and, and uh, look at motivations and what might cause a character to act and behave in that certain way. So, you know, and I had to go back cause I, 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 I can't even remember how many times I watched that scene, <laughs> but then I was watching how you literally ended it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, why would you end it like that? And then I got to thinking because now she doesn't know where to go from here. So it only makes sense to go to black. Yeah, exactly. 
you got it. <laughs> that was said so eloquently. Yeah, because, and it took me a while to figure it out because I'm like, you left, you know, at first I was like, you left me hanging. And I'm like, no, because this is based on the character, mm -hmm. not based on the film. This is mm -hmm. based on the character. So it's just like, she doesn't know what to do. She just saw Earl die. Yeah. And now she's like, so when her mother makes that end, yeah. she doesn't know what she's going to do. Exactly. Because like I said, she kept waking up around nine o'clock in the morning. So she never, she never had a life plan. Right. You know, so she's just a messed up, no plan kind of girl. And mm -hmm. she'd been winging it. But now life is real and she yeah. won't be able to wing it. Exactly. Yep. She's a, a fly by the seat of her pants kind of gal. Um, and I think just taking things as they came. And now her whole reason for for literally getting up in the morning, whatever time she gets up, uh, she was getting up is gone. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for all the audiences that have seen this film, what's their reaction to it? <laughs> to that moment or to the film just in general? Oh, just for the whole film in general. Well, I think what's funny to me is when I watch the film with an audience uh, in a theater, people don't know whether they're supposed to laugh or not. Um, <laughs> and I laughed. Yes, laugh. Yeah, I think when the the reveal of the bags, when you find out she's a con, so the first kind of twist, uh, usually always gets a laugh. Um, and then by that point, people kind of ease into it a little bit. And then it's funny, the biggest laugh in the whole movie is when Earl dies. It is the biggest laugh in the whole movie. Um, and then when she get when she falls and everything falls out there's usually an audible <gasps> and then it's uh it's a little more patient after that it's a it's a little more um um people are with you they're invested in in what's going to happen um and and i've had people say that they it really resonated with them because they would do anything for their parent that passed away or they would have really done anything for them just the person that they loved and um there have been people that have, have cried at the end of the film you know, so it you, kind of takes you through a range yeah because see you had you you had all the patients all of their rooms were brightly lit mm -hmm. but her mom's was not yeah yeah so i as you said as you you very cleverly picked up on this is character driven and a lot of this film was shot from her perspective the 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 choices that were made were indicative of things that were going on kind of in her head so i think that specifically when you get to the music which is a little um um i'm gonna say jazzy for what you would expect to find in this kind of movie it was um, it was because when when it went and when it faded to black yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. Because so, it, it's almost like it, it's the, the music reminds you of a film as it was a caper. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That was exactly what I was going for because I think in her head, she had convinced herself she was the star of a caper. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll notice that the music stops when things get very real, which is when it, the call happens about her mother and she realizes that she has to go and face her mom. And so things, there's a shift at that moment too, um, just in terms of what the, the hospital rooms look like. They were a little more idealized in the, the first, with the other patients when she was being other people. The music was very caper-esque. And then it's silent when it's when she's with her mom. There is no music. There's there's just silence, and it's really hard to escape. The Tell you situation. the truth, I didn't notice the music 
until it went fade to black yeah. because I was so con I was concentrating so much on the character and the story. The music score went completely over my head. And for a lot of people, I don't care what film it is. If you ask people, Oh, do you, what do you think of that music score? And they're like, there is music because yeah, exactly. you, know, you know how people are. And so when it, when the credit hit, I went, that's, it's like a caper. And I went, <laughs> That would, for me, that was one of the most interesting, I don't want to call it a twist. And it, it was the most interesting element because it's like, that was a serious moment. And then yeah. you get this music. And, I'm like, <laughs> and I went, okay, this film is going to go beyond this short. And that's how <laughs> I looked at it. Well, you you are quite right. Like I said, there's a, there are plans for a feature. We have a really that Jesse sure knows how to write because he also wrote a banger of a feature script. Um, and I actually just got the the most recent draft of it like two days ago, and it's it's ready. It's ready to go. So I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah, you could even you could even turn this into a streaming series because there's so many different characters that can be introduced. And yeah. even having an element to where, you know how some streaming series are, you have someone that I guess you say they're like, they're, they're the villain. They're doing something mm -hmm. wrong. Andy it's kind of like, yeah. yeah. But then you have, then you have someone in law enforcement going, you know, you know, it's almost like they get a tip, you know, there's something going on here, but they can't figure it out. They, they show mm -hmm. up. And they're face to face with the, the person doing it all, but they don't know it's the person that's doing it, even though they're standing right in front of them. And I'm like, dad, this could go that way. Oh, Lord. I will not tell you specifically what happens in the future, but I will uh, I will say you are very perceptive. <laughs> Ooh, you I'm, I'm getting really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would say that you are. Well, um, how long have you been Oscar qualified? Um, we have been Oscar qualified since I, the spring, since the spring. Um, but I'm very excited to be amongst all of the wonderful films that are Oscar qualified this year. I mean, like it's, it's an honor just to be in there with everybody. I'm thrilled. Um, it's a, it's a fun season. I feel like they have that. Did you watch Shit's Creek where they, uh, they asked Moira, what's your favorite season? And she said awards. Um, I feel that now. <laughs> yeah. Good Daughter is a short film about a small time con artist ripping off elderly dementia patients by pretending to be their daughter until the con catches up with her. Now they say you can't con a con until the con becomes overwhelming and learning the con is starting to con you. Now, Good Daughter has all the elements of the makings of a feature film, as I want to see more of Samantha Sloyan's character, Rebecca. So much more to explore here, and it seems we all will soon find out that this film is going to be playing out, and we can't wait to see where it all goes. So, Rachel, I want to thank you so much for sharing this Oscar-qualified short with thank us today. so much, Ward. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. I could chat movies with you all day long, too. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And again, ladies and gentlemen, when you have the opportunity to see Good Daughter, this is a film you do want to see. You got to absorb all of the storyline because there's so much to see, so much to watch and to dissect in this incredible film. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for watching. You'll either see me at the movies or from the red carpet.